What's up, yo? This is Leon, the Paperback Maniac, coming at you with another vintage paperback horror review. Tonight, we are taking a look at Sleep Tight by Matthew J. Costello. This book was published by Zebra in 1987, and it is oh so 1987. I will go ahead and read the synopsis from the back cover. Sweet terror. It started with a little boy. A little boy who sneaked out to go to the pool and was never seen again. Old Miss Waverly disappeared soon afterward. And then that hotshot student vanished into thin air. Things like this just didn't happen in a quiet town like Harley. Except that Harley was no longer a quiet town. Sweet dreams. Noah was getting scared. He knew something bad was happening because his father came home looking worried every night. And his mother wouldn't let him go anywhere alone. And then the dreams began. The tall man was coming to get him. The tall man was coming to steal a little boy's soul and feed off his innocence. So, uh, as this synopsis tells us, there has been a rash of disappearances in the sleepy suburban town of Harley, New York. Uh, we get one right in the prologue where, uh, as we were told here, a, a seven-year-old boy, against his mother's wishes, sneaks out of the house to go to the local swimming pool and is abducted by a sinister and mysterious figure who has been stalking him through the town. Uh, next, we get uh, an old, a middle-aged lady uh, who is coming home from choir practice and is likewise abducted. Uh, she, she feels a, a hand clamp over her mouth, and then uh, she is swept away by this mysterious uh, tall figure and taken uh, to a, a house where she is uh, locked up in the basement. We get a, a teenager, this hotshot teenager from the synopsis, who uh, is pulling his car or his dad's car into the garage after dropping his date off and is also abducted by this uh, mysterious shadowy figure and dragged through the streets and taken back to the same white uh, fancy house and locked up in the basement. And he uh, notices in the basement uh, a, a large uh, purple curtain and then a chair with belts and straps facing the curtain. And this mysterious figure actually puts him in the chair, straps him down, yanks back the curtain, and reveals something behind the curtain that causes the boy to scream uh, with, you know, insanity. Probably my favorite is uh, an ex-con named Eddie Dixon, who has recently been released from the uh, state correctional facility for robbery and murder, and who uh, hates the town of Harley, is resentful for living and being stuck in such a pisshole of a town, as he claims, uh, he decides that he is going to, you know, get get out of there. Uh, he wants to find a nice uh, house that he can break into and rob. So he goes uh, goes out one night, uh, wanders off into the uh, bourgey uh, section of town, finds a finds a house that looks like it's just the ticket. This large white fancy house that seems like it probably has all kinds of valuable treasures inside. Uh, he has a moment, uh, so he sneaks out like into the bushes and waits for the. Um, the lights to go off, has a little fantasy of maybe slipping upstairs to the bedroom and maybe like gently nudging awake the sleeping forms of the residents of the house and kind of uh, watching them as their eyes sort of bug out as they see his uh, form uh, kind of hovering over them in, in, in their bed, like with a knife in his hands. Yeah, real, real wholesome guy, this Eddie. Uh, so he g uh, breaks into the house and kind of wanders around. He goes upstairs, finds a bunch of empty bedrooms. It's almost as if no one lives there. He's getting a little pissed off. He decides to check the basement. He goes down to the basement and he sees, uh, again, this uh, strange uh, purple curtain. And he's like, what the hell is this? He yanks back the curtain. Behind the curtain is a mirror, this large mirror. Now this mirror uh, is strangely though, uh, reflects things, uh, everything is like distorted. So it kind of makes him, gives him like this fun house sort of distorted look to his face. Then he notices that uh, everything in the mirror is sort of swirling. The colors are kind of shifting and swirling around like oil on water. And then it gets really bright. 
And then the swirling ceases, and suddenly he's looking into this strange alien landscape with with these with this odd flora. He sees these trees uh, with kind of like these purplish pustules uh, for for leaves, and uh, he sees like these birds with teeth, uh, sort of. Uh, ch chipping away and, and snapping at uh, these leaves and things are slithering on the ground um, and, and he's just very weirded out by this. He's like, what is this I'm looking at? He starts backing away and he backs into this mysterious tall man who who kind of like, he looks back behind him. This tall man's like, you going somewhere? And he's like, and, and, he, and Eddie then becomes frozen in fear. He actually can't move he, he he's stuck there he's paralyzed he's like what's going on why can't i move and this tall man is like because i don't want you to i've been waiting for you you're perfect you're, you're the perfect one for tonight and then he's like look back in the mirror and then eddie uh looks back in the mirror and he sees this uh this creature uh kind of coming toward him this strange uh eel-like uh creature approaching and this is probably, the suspense of that scene in particular is probably the most masterfully done scene in the whole book. Because you get like Eddie, his heart is pounding furiously as he's watching this, this strange unearthly creature coming toward him. But then the creature vanishes for a moment and he thinks, oh, he's safe, it's gone, before then rearing back up just at the last moment. And it's got like this hammer-shaped head, it's got these bulging, knotty muscles... And this strange, like, mouth-like orifice lined with razor-sharp teeth that clamp down on Eddie's neck, bite, bite into him and decapitate him. And his body falls down in the reflection of the mirror, and he falls into this purplish soil of this alien landscape and sort of uh, perishes, disappears. So, you know, all these strange things are happening in town. The townspeople, as you could expect, are, you know, very worried. There's threats of, you know, them forming a vigilante group. No one is more concerned about this than the mayor of the town, uh, mayor come a uh, bookstore owner. I, I love that the mayor is also the uh, like a bookstore owner, a guy named Jack Riley. Jack Riley is concerned. He's been like working with the chief of police. Uh, they're trying to figure out what's going on. They don't understand, you know, the police are baffled. This doesn't appear to be like a serial killer because there's no pattern to these disappearances. It doesn't seem to be, a, you know, a sex offender because of the variety of, you know, the age and the sex of the, the victims. So they really don't know what, to, what what's going on. Uh, Jack decides uh, to help out the chief of police by aiding uh, some other guy that they've called in from out of state to help with this case, uh, a guy named Captain Merritt. Who, who's come at being brought in to sort of investigate. And so they're trying to figure out what's going on. Eventually, of course, um, we get uh, a, a World War II veteran uh, slash professor of anthropology who shows up with our exposition. Although I got to say, this book is a little light on exposition. It, it never really explains things too, too carefully. But he basically explains who this tall man is, the history of the tall man, and, you know, what this mirror is. Essentially a portal into another uh, dimension. And uh, basically this man, this tall man, has found a way to summon up uh, you know, the creatures from this other dimension, such as that eel-like creature that got at the ex-con Eddie Dixon. And so, you know, Jack Riley uh, wants to get to the bottom of this because he is a family man himself. He's got a wife, uh, a wife, a, a malcontent wife, This, uh, in a little bit of character, uh, attempted characterization. His wife is, you know, this suburban, sort of discontent suburban housewife who is, you know, bored of the suburbs and has been having an affair with a local uh, art gallery owner. But he's got, you know, this wife, he's got a, a, a little young boy named Noah, and he's got a tween daughter named um, Sarah, who is at risk, of course, of becoming abducted by the tall man. And, um, and we, we're never exactly explained what this tall man's purpose ultimately is. There is some brief mention that uh, this being that the tall man summoned uh, cannot stay on Earth because he you know, consists of matter, not of this Earth, unless, however, he procreates, in which case he, he can stay on this plane of existence. And there is some intimation that maybe he wants to procreate with uh, you know, one of the female victims, 
but um, it's never it's never really fully explained. That's not really you know too high up on this author's priority list. But um, as you can tell from that synopsis, I mean, the, the, this is standard fare, highly highly derivative. I mean, the 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 name of the baddie is even kind of flagrantly <laughs> taken from a, a similar, much better horror story of an interdimensional being terrorizing a, a small town and children called Phantasm. <laughs> Phantasm, I mean, it's also called The Tall Man. Um, and so so actually, originality is definitely not this novel's strong suit. Um, but, you know, this is pretty much your standard typical zebra book of this period of, you know, you know, mid to late eighties. Um, it's pretty much what I think of when I think of zebra. I, every time I open one of these zebra books, I always have high hopes because I have been, you know, entertained by them in the past. Um, you know, they're never really that original or strong on characterization. They can oftentimes be just batshit crazy and very violent. This book is neither batshit crazy nor particularly violent. I'd say its strengths lie in um, a its evocation uh, of you know kind of a hot, hazy, humid summer. This is a summer book, which is kind of cool, seeing as you know I read this at the start of summer. It really kind of evokes that feeling, especially like uh, a place where it's humid out. Like you know, I grew up in the Midwest, so I know I totally know those kind of the feeling of that sticky sort of summers where like the air is just thick with heat and moisture and really the only, you know, refuge you can have is maybe just like a cold dip in a chilly blue swimming pool. Um, that was really well done. The writing is, is, is pretty well done. Um, but probably the best thing about this book, uh, which I alluded to earlier, is the myriad 80s references and the fact that this book is so 1987. There are, um, you know, there are scenes where uh, teenage girls are having a slumber party and they're watching uh, Friday the 13th Part 6 on VHS while, you know, downing cherry cokes. You know, that's just great. I, I wrote down some of these. So we've got references to The Cosby Show. We've got Mr. Coffee, New Coke, Halloween Part 4, USA Network Sunday Morning Cartoon Show, uh, Little Kids with Star Wars Bed Sheets. We've got Scooby-Doo, He-Man, She-Ra, Dungeons and Dragons, Tom and Jerry, Judy Bloom, MTV, Cassette Tapes, Huey Lewis and the News, Tears for Fears, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Twisted Sister T-shirts, David Lee Roth, Mr. T, uh, Mad Max, the list goes on and on. <laughs> that is probably the fact that this book is so dated in that way and is very much a time capsule of that period. Um, and, and, you know, going along with how derivative it is of other, you know, better, uh, particularly movies of that time period, that is probably the most charming thing about this book. Um, you know, it's not by far not even close to being, you know, the best zebra book I've ever read. But, um, you know, it was a fun enough waste of time. Um, you know, I would give this, you know, I would round it up to a three out of five just because I'm a generous guy. It's, it's probably more of like 2.5 out of five. I don't like to give number ratings in these reviews, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's perfectly mediocre, essentially. It's not, not terrible. It's not offensively bad. Definitely not great. But, uh, Matthew J. Costello definitely shows promise. This is his first published novel. Definitely has some writing chops. As I said, uh, you know, some of his imagery is good, and I do have um, a few of his other books, and I do look forward to reading more. So, yeah, that is Sleep Tight, guys. Uh, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed the review. Stick around. I've got a bunch of uh, books lined up to, to, you know, read and review this summer. Uh, a bunch more fun uh, collection videos. So, uh, definitely... Stay tuned for that. I will see you guys later. Peace out.